On Wednesday, Keith Raboy broke some groundbreaking news. He would be leaving Founders Fund to rejoin Coastal Adventures. Today, we have the exclusive of why Keith decided to move back to Coastal and the plans ahead. Talk to me, Keith, moving back to Coastal. There's certain things about, you know, KB that I kind of miss, and then there's and so the combination made a lot of sense. 10 years out. Is Keith at KV then? Is Keith doing his own fun? I think the two most obvious components to answer are... Keith, I am so excited for this. My word, you decided to save some of the biggest VC news for the start of the year. So thank you so much for joining me today first. It's a pleasure to be with you again. So, uh, <laughs> talk to me, Keith. Moving back to Coastler, um, I guess the first question is, why did you decide to make the move back from Founders Fund to Coastler again? Well, you know, in some ways, so I spent six years, just so everybody has some context, I spent six years from 2013 to 2019 as an MD at Coastal Ventures, and we had a really successful run together. Uh, mm -hmm. KB4, KB5, and KB6 were the funds I was a partner in, and we produced, you know, really stellar returns working as a collaboration team between Vinod, Samir, Cole, David Wyden, and Sven. And um, I never really left in some senses because after I left, I stayed in really significant contact with Vinod, Samir, and David particularly. We co-invested almost every quarter together. So Samir invested and led a financing round in the company I run as CEO in OpenStore. Samir led the Series A for a company that you're familiar with, Trauma. Um, you know, he led the Series A for Mike's company. So we worked together. We worked, we worked together there. Uh, I led a growth round from one of Samir's favorite companies called uh, Ultima, Ultima Genomics. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a company I learned a lot about, a founder I knew really well from my days at KB. Samir also led, you know, an investment round in Varda, uh, Delian's company. I worked very closely with David Wyden on a bunch of companies, including Fair, Bungalow. Um, so I felt like I was actually seeing more of Samir and David than I did when I was at KB for six years in the last five years at Founders Fund. I, because in, in basically when I was at KB, I would see them every Monday for hours at a time, but I didn't really see them Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because we were all go, going meeting with founders, doing one-on-one -on -one with founders, attending board meetings, you know, uh, taking pitches, et cetera. Um, whereas over the last five years, actually, I was working with Samir and David basically every single week. Um, and so in some ways, you know, the bridging and bonding got stronger um, over the last five years than in the six years when we were just debating at partner meetings. There's certain things about, you know, KB that led to that successful track record uh, at uh, in KB 4, 5, and 6 that I kind of missed. And then there's several personal things that just were more appealing to me as a human, you know, it, aside from my professional aspirations and goals and ambitions. And so the combination made a lot of sense. The recombination made a lot of sense. Um, I even spoke at the KV CEO summit, you know, last May. Um, so, you know, I, I've stayed in quite close contact with all the partners at KV. I even helped recruit Nikita originally to KV. So I'm extremely excited to be able to work with them. You, you said there about kind of the, the things that you missed that were in, inherent in KV4, KV5 and KV6, and then the personal. If we just take those two, what was it that you missed that was kind of central to the success of those funds? So we had very extensive partner meetings every Monday for hours at a time, and we vigorously debated new investments as well as the impact and the potential upside of the current portfolio. These were very unstructured and very vigorous debates, particularly with Vinod and Samir, David, and sometimes Sven. And I felt that they made me a sharper investor, a smarter investor, even though it was ultimately my decision on what to do with the companies that I was championing or the companies that I was on the board of. They made my brain work better by listening to them. And occasionally I made the mistake of over listening, but it was always my mistake. And I felt like I was doing my job better listening to the stereo surround, uh, you know, Vinod's perspective, Samir's perspective, David's perspective. I even carried it with me to FF in, in my brain for the first year where I could hear their voices. Every time I was thinking about an investment, I hear David whispering about the financials and the calculation of the contribution margin. And I hear Samir talking about certain things about the founder. And I would definitely think about Vinod talking about the up option value upside and et cetera. And the team, and we need to get more data science talents in the company. So I was like wandering around with their voices in my head. But I actually think that made me a better investor. And so I missed that. And on the personal side, as you know, KV is significantly branded 
uh, successfully in the deep tech, hardcore technology investing space. And even though that's not my forte and it's not my comparative advantage in life, I felt I was learning something new about the world every week. So for example, after six years of education, I actually understand at a high level, the innovation in batteries, what's hard. You have the theoretical limits of chemistry and physics at the same time. I learned a lot about robotics. I learned a lot about the fundamentals of AI. I learned about liquid biopsy to detect cancer. I learned about how what's difficult about using CRISPR to actually treat humans. Like what it's most of the delivery mechanism, for example. I learned so much and I felt like I was becoming broader as a person, even if it didn't really translate to the day-to-day -day investment decisions I was making. Uh, so I really missed that. Um, it was like getting a free education in the world of technology every week. And as I was growing up, it's like I could read, I, I read a lot of books. I'm a racist reader, but it's like in um, parallel, I was actually learning by going to partner meetings. And so that was, that was like a free benefit of doing my job. Can I ask, on the, you mentioned the, the Monday partner meetings there and the rigorous debate. That's what kind of we think of with venture partnership discussions. <laughs> that's not the way that Founders Fund structures it? No, um, Founders Fund, especially when I joined, was very much people running their own investment strategies. Think of it as like a PM running their own investment strategies. And there's a way of syncing and getting a certain number of uh, critical mass and votes to support an investment at different thresholds of dollar figures. But it really wasn't designed for the most part for that kind of analytical rigor. And it, some things have changed over time and there's more of this or more of that. So it's not quite as binary. But KV had the conventional paradigmatic old school partner meetings every week. And they were quite substantive, quite dense. Even the preparation for those meetings on Sunday. Sunday for me used to be when I was the operating executive at let's say Square or LinkedIn. Sunday would be the day that I would kind of do brainstorming and strategy, pull out my big large notebook and kind of redesign org charts and things like that or read. Sunday at KV was a full dense day of writing substantive memo emails, reading other people's decks and, and analysis. I didn't have time to, to let my brain wander at all on Sundays because there was so much preparation that, that was going into each Monday partner meeting. You also didn't have time to do berries, my friend. Oh, no, I definitely <laughs> did berries. Don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, can I ask, I, I obviously spoke to Vinod before this, and he said in particular, no one really runs the firm. Partners work closely together. Each MD can decide to make an investment, even if the others disagree. How do you think about, bluntly, listening to people at KV without letting it impact your mindset and decision-making process negatively to the extent where you could say no to something that could be great. You know, and what, the way it really works and the way the rubber kind of beats the road is sort of like a certain amount of social capital. So I have a certain amount of social capital within the firm. If I want to do something that's very non-standard or very controversial or not expected, I'm kind of burning and consuming some social capital. Now, if I make the right call that, that gets paid back with interest, and you know, the next time I want to make a controversial decision, it's actually even easier. But Vinod's right in the sense of there were times at KD where I wanted to do X, Y, or Z in my six years there. And there was some critical feedback in, and maybe I listened to it, but it was always my decision to listen to it. So there are times that maybe I regret me like actually listening to it, that I should have you know, had more confidence and more conviction. And then there's times actually counterintuitively, and people sometimes forget this, there are times that I would actually champion an investment, champion a company, and the reaction afterwards would not be critical, it would be more enthusiastic than even I was. Like the, the reaction in the room was like, do not lose this investment. Like, doesn't matter if you have to, you know, invest at a higher valuation than we normally and typically would, this is actually really good. So sometimes it would actually cut the other way. It wasn't just like critical, like what the hell are you thinking? It was like, oh no, no, this, this one's really special. Like you're right and double down right now, like sign that service today. So for example, like I'll give you a couple of concrete examples that are now dated. So it's, it's worth, mm. it's easy to talk about. I remember when we were considering the first institutional investment in Max Lepchin's company at a firm and their uniform reaction was Keith, make this happen. <laughs> and then, so, you know, then the only question was, you know, Max and I had to work out like what a fair valuation would be. The reaction was like that war when I brought in uh, Open Door, we were incubating Open Door and Eric came in to present uh, the company. People were familiar and people knew that I wanted to incubate it. So there was, you know, a default kind of like leaning in. But afterwards, everybody was like, this is a no brainer. We absolutely should do this. 
you know, close this. Is there an example, sorry to ask this, is there an example where they persuaded you not to and you regret it? I knew that I was on the edge of consensus and I was going to burn a lot of social capital, mostly on should I increase the valuation of a particular offer? So it wasn't like, should we proceed or not? It was like these terms feel rich, you know, and make sure the risk rewards there. So for example, um, I can think of two or three where I knew that I was at the edge of the valuation range of what coastal ventures would typically accept. And there was enough criticism and concerns about the company that really was taking a lot of liberties to go further. And once in a while I did, decided to pay, you know, whatever the valuation was required. And once in a while I went out, um, I've told the story publicly before one of the examples and probably, you know, the one I lose most sleep about, you know, after like almost 11 years of being a VC is Rickling. So Rickling came in, Pugger came in, um, and we gave a term sheet, uh, it was, you know, obviously controversial at the time for the, for the seed and Gary Tan initialized also gave a term sheet. And at the time there was about a $10 million gap. I probably offered five at 25 plus or minus for memory. And I think Gary was at like 35 and Parker really wanted me to increase the offer. And I felt like there was just enough consensus to get the offer out um, that if I really moved the needle that I, I might be burning a lot more capital than I thought I should. And obviously it's turned out to be an unmitigated disaster for me. Fortunately, it's worked out really well for Parker. Uh, so, you know, he probably doesn't, care very much, but I obviously have have think about this all the time. And then there was, there's a moment also on a different axis that I've also mentioned publicly before, where I had already like locked in uh, a term sheet to lead the series C for Robinhood, uh, Chilean at 20 post, which was pretty expensive, but they came back and um, really wanted me to join the board in the seed round. And this was in maybe my second year at KB. So I asked, you know, Vinod and Samir at the partner meeting, can I join the board? And the uniform reaction was like, no way. You can't be joining like all these boards on seed. Like that just won't work. So we decided to part ways very friendly. You know, I just said, I can't join the board. And they wound up finding other investors. Obviously another sort of unmitigated disaster. Um, but, you know, they were right for the most part that you cannot be an institutional investor in a multi-stage fund constantly joining boards at seed so you have to be very judicious so the feedback wasn't wrong it was just wrong as applied to that company it was totally up to me i would have joined the board uh, i was in a sweet spot an area i know a lot about i had a lot of conviction about the strategy that they were going to follow etc um interestingly enough when the same thing happened four years later um i met another company that i had strong conviction about and I was going to lead the seed, this company called Fair. Fair came back and said, Max said to me, we, you know, we chatted with, I chatted with my co-founders and, you know, we'll say yes, but you have to join the board. And having learned and been burned by the uh, Robin Hood experience, I never really told my partners that I was going to join the board. I just said yes. So uh, they're probably happy with me now, but um, I probably kept that a little quiet for about a year. Which will be a bigger outcome. Yeah, no, no, it's going to, it, it, Fair is great. It's a wonderful company. And, you know, the logic I had was it wasn't like I misled anybody. Nobody actually asked me if I was joining the board. But um, the logic I had was Max and Jeff, particularly um, two of the co-founders of FAIR, CEO and COO, um, actually had worked for me at Square. We played soccer together for years before that. They were going to be calling and texting me whenever they wanted anyway, or, you know, I'd meet with them whenever they wanted. So there was a really incremental time commitment. Like they had me on speed dial, whatever they wanted they were going to get, you know, in terms of help, assistance, ideas. Uh, so I felt like there really wasn't an impact to KV in my time allocation by saying yes. I want to unpack a couple of elements there. You said it about price sensitivity, especially with Rippling 35 versus 25. Which firm would you say is more price sensitive, KV or Founders Fund? And just pause, is it even good to be price sensitive in the way well, that- if you're That's the big art, you know, art, the whole art, all right? So um, Historically, I'd say KB has been more price disciplined than Founders Fund, but I think Founders Fund is actually more price sensitive and more disciplined than most people give them credit for. Like I actually noticed this when I joined, the discipline internally is, was much uh, stronger than I thought from afar, you know, watching the firm. Um, so, and, and I think they're 
closer. KD has historically been maybe the most price disciplined of any large institutional fund. I think they have a KB. We maybe now uh, have relaxed out a bit. I've seen when I was at Founders Fund, I actually saw some term sheets that KB extended. I was looking back and saying, wow, where that come from? Like, that's how weird it would have happened in my day. Um, but, uh, so, but I think of the major firms, uh, maybe KB and Founders Fund may be the two most disciplined. I think Sequoia has also historically been very price disciplined. Uh, to their credit, they've also relaxed that a bit. Um, but very, I think very top down and consciously. But I think historically, those three might be the most price disciplined. Now, interestingly enough, the more important topic is what you know. Should you be? Should you care? How much you care, etc. And I still remember this episode you recorded with Peter Fenton mm. when Peter said price is always a trap. And, you know, this was early in my career, uh, but maybe it didn't be recorded before I started as VC, but I listened to it. And I didn't totally grok it when I listened to that episode that you recorded with Peter. Over the arc of my uh, 11 years, the wisdom behind Peter, uh, uh, his insight has stuck with me even more and more, especially for what I do, which is primarily seed in Series A. When Peter, when Fed was saying the price is always a trap, that's really an excuse for not having conviction. That's basically translated your whole episode with him. Uh, <laughs> the short version of that is he's mostly right that when at a seed round or a series A round, when you're walking away at price, it is a bit of lack of conviction. And you really should be looking in the mirror and say, why don't I have conviction? Because if you call, if you make the right call at seed, you're going to wind up in a pretty good place if that company is iconic. And even at A, if you make the right call at almost any price, you're going to be pretty happy. At price, Series B, that's not true. At Series B, you can pick a good company and invest in it, but you pay the wrong price. The risk reward is totally out of the, totally out, out of whack. You may not even make real money. But I'm primarily leading C, the first institutional round in companies. Is you know my goal in life is to be the first institutional investor. So I paid a you know relatively high price for fair. Like twenty million post was actually high, or maybe even twenty two um, back then. But I haven't looked back at all since then. I, so I totally agree with you. Listen, if it all goes plan, you won't regret it. But when you actually look back at portfolios and see average entry price being twelve and a half, and then five years later, average entry price being twenty five or thirty, you've just halved your returns. Well, yeah. So people have forgotten this, and you know, one thing that Peter Thiel is really disciplined about is he totally understands this, this, these dynamics really well, and is always pointing this out internally, sometimes externally, that your returns are not going to be the same as what you expect when that's what's going on in the macro environment. And so you can't follow the same strategy with a different kind of entry price on average at all. But, you know, once in a while, knowing when to stray. So when I invested in the ramp in the seed round, which obviously proven to be a very good investment, the pricing on that was extraordinarily high for a seed round. What was the price? It, it probably, it might have been 40 posts, but it was more than 30. Wow, I, and respectfully, like, I remember Eric did Parabus before, but like it wasn't a you know hugely unicorn founder. No, and, you know, in fact, it was quite controversial. I sometimes think that it might have been the most courageous investment I've made as a VC because everybody was so addicted to this Brex, you know, nonsense. Um, and you know, typically not the best strategy to fast follow. You know, another startup that has traction. I knew that space cold. I knew exactly what Brex was going to do wrong. And I knew that if we could find the right founders, we could absolutely dominate. And that's proven to be the case. Ramp is absolutely going to be the winner. Probably will be two, three, four, five, ten times more valuable. When you invest at Seed today, do you, and you're concerned about price, do you ask yourself, do I really have enough conviction? I'm try, I try to do that. I really try to apply Peter Fenton's you know, sort of adage now much more frequently. I do think about, though, capitalization over time. You do have to take into account... What kind of company is this? How much capital is it going to require to achieve certain milestones? Um, and you know, it depends on what the company is aspiring to do. Because if your capitalization is going to require so much and your first entry price is so high, that company may not be set up for success. And that you know may decrease the overall probability of being successful, which is a material problem. So in certain verticals, like the, the step, there may be a step functions that you have to achieve as opposed to a uh, kind of a continuous curve of progress. 
And in those step function ones, if you slightly miss and your valuation entry price is too high, that company's dead. And that's a real problem. You said there about kind of dilution concerns and sensitivity. The way you protect against that is obviously by continuing to invest. KV obviously have continuous funds now. We'll get into the separate structures. I, I don't like reserves though, Keith, and I don't like reserves. And please educate me but because it's trash and investing. If I had done reserves, I would have put money into Hopin, Clubhouse, and Be Real. That would not have been a good set of investments. So how do you think about that? And bluntly, proactively allocating ahead of time, especially when you don't know what's coming. You know, this is another one of those. There's like three or four things in venture that nobody knew, nobody does super well. Honestly, yeah. um, it's much more art than science. How to do reserves is one of those topics. At KD, there is a more disciplined, let's say, approach to reserves. That doesn't mean better, by the way. Just it is more top down. Like, what are our reserves? How much are we going to allocate to company X, Y, and Z? You know, how much we, how much do we, how much total allocations do we have? Should we shave this one, increase this one, et cetera? Whereas at Founders Fund, there's no explicitly a policy of not reserving, and every investment decision is on an ad hoc case by case basis. And there's strong merits to that, actually. Even though most of my investment style may be closer to KV, I think I'm closer to the Founders Fund style of you're probably better off not reserving and then making ad hoc decisions. Uh, based upon the quality of that particular opportunity, which includes who's the investor, what's the traction of the company, what do we believe about the founder, what do we learn about the founder's abilities and traits, and then what's the valuation. Do you worry that with the second model being Founders Fund's model, when founders say, hey, what's your approach to reinvesting? And you say, it's a dogfight for it. You've got to prove yourself and it's, you know, it's there to be earned. It's not as enticing and in saying, oh, we allocate X amount of reserves when we invest. I worry. I, that I think I'm... in theory, there's there might have been some truth to that. But in practice, just observing observing Founders Fund before I joined working there five years, I never saw it be it never translated into a practical problem with a founder. Okay, well, going back to seed, but before we kind of move away, you said about kind of risk and Series B being a challenging place in terms of risk and not being paid for it. I don't think you're paid for the risk that we take at seed, Keith. Well, we're, seed... we're not. We're not at all. Um, but the outliers are, I think the seed range, of, let's, let's assume a seed range these days is, I don't know, 8 million post to 20. Somewhere that probably lower on that spectrum now. I still see five on 25 daily with oh, God. Andrew yeah, so those I would not be doing. Uh, absent extraordinary reasons. So one of the metaphors I learned, I forget who actually taught me this. It might have been someone at KB, but Scott Nolan at Founders Fund also applies this. Is you're basically, it's like a play poker. And every round is like a card you're being dealt. And there's different informational content. And there's a different price point for that round. So what's the information you get from that new card? And then what's the price? Five on 25 from scratch, that card is very expensive for a certain amount of informational content. So that's probably a very rare opportunity that you want to say yes to. Now, I will say, I, it's not like I'll hold it now. I've definitely done that. Um, as I said, you know, I gave a term sheet to Rippling under, you know, with those terms exactly. Um, I closed a deal in, with for a Miami-based company at FF with a good friend of mine, the CEO, that we haven't we haven't announced publicly yet, but had those kind of terms too. So I will do it, but you want to know why you're doing it because that is that 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 card price point is not smart, generally speaking. It's not at all. Again, kind of price discipline is one area where you can be disciplined. Like temporal diversification, the speed with which you deploy is another area you can be disciplined. The other Found reason I did, so one of the reasons why I, I did consider uh, why well, I will consider it is. The question is, where's that five? How's that five calculated? Is the founder reverse engineering from a evaluation expectation, which in that case, I'm usually going to barf, or is five the correct dose to achieve certain accomplishments that will unlock the next round? And there are sometimes some markets where really sub five, you can't achieve those milestones. So you're kind of fooling yourself. You can give a term sheet at two or three, you know, at a lower valuation, but the company's not going to achieve what it needs to achieve. So the time I pulled the trigger in Miami, 5 million was the correct dosing, uh, period. If I had been CEO, I absolutely would have wanted to raise five, period. And so I felt comfortable that this was not just a negotiation tactic. It was actually a very coherent strategy and it's 
proven to be great. The company's doing phenomenally well. We have already doubled down on that founders fund on the company. You said that's what they need. Truth be told, we're seeing a lot of rounds that are 15 to 30, 40 even, especially in kind of AI with pedigreed founders. What do you make of those? Because when we see those, you, you probably don't need 15, 20, 30 to get started. And how do you feel about those? It depends. Insane? So one of the one of the most important pieces of feedback a really good VC can give a founder is what do you need to achieve where the rest of the world will then appreciate you? So that capital is unlocked. Subsequent capital will be easy to raise. And it depends on what business you're in, what market you're in, what your team composition is. But one of the things I try to do is calibrate that right away. So, okay, for this kind of company with this team, if we can achieve two of the following three things, people are going to appreciate us, whether it's my firm or someone else's firm. So let's let's dial in how much time and how much money is it going to take to get there? And let's make sure you have the sufficient resources. It's a little bit like the driving the car metaphor of like there's some destination you need to get to, certain amount of fuel that's required to get to that destination, but I don't want to overfuel you. That doesn't work. It's like a plane where you overfuel, you're just like bogging the plane down and it, it sort of creates more resistance. I There are times when 10 million, like, so for example, let's talk about Open Door. We raised 10 on the seed for Open Door. That was actually the correct dose. Buying homes and you really can't prove that you can buy cohorts of homes accurately, like priced accurately and resold properly in le for less than about 10 million. Maybe you can make it eight, but eight to 12. Otherwise it's not, it's really not worth trying for less than 10. Like you're fooling yourself. So 10 million was the proper sized round for that particular shot on goal. Do you think that series A is the best place to be investing today? I think the risk reward can be really strong. Um, it's hyper competitive. So one of the other lessons, you know, you kind of take from zero to one and is globally true is you want to be careful about like hyper competition. My belief is I like to lead seed rounds. The reason why I like to lead seed rounds is they're less competitive, first of all, like because what I'm working with typically is a keynote deck and a team. Most investors are terrified of assessing a team and a keynote deck and handing over one, two, three, four, five, you know, million dollars. I actually think that's my comparative advantage is doing that. So I want to do it as often as possible. Secondarily, because I believe I can have some impact in the company, the earlier I get involved, the less I inherit things that might've been avoidable. Like I, you know, I've used this metaphor with you about concrete. So early stage companies, it's kind of like liquid concrete. It's very malleable and then it solidifies post series B. It's it's totally solidified. And if you want to change something, you know, that's concrete, you have to bolt this jackhammer, which is incredibly painful, expensive, noisy. So I don't want to be manipulating solidified concrete. I want it while it's liquid and malleable. So the earlier I can get involved, the better. So that's where I want to be competing. Series A, though, the risk reward, generally speaking, can be pretty strong, but you're competing with other people who are very good at what they do. Benchmark's pretty good at what they do. Sequoia has been, you know, historically very good at what they do. Uh, you know, you're running right down the middle of some of the best investors on the planet versus C, you're not, and Series B, maybe you're not. Do you think that's still there when you see the multi-stage firms move so aggressively into seed and then you look at a lot of the partners who led $20 million Series A checks in years prior go, oh, I'm underwater with board commitments. I need to fire sale a load of shit companies. Like, I'm not, I don't want to do new deals. I almost think A is better because they're just saying to all the young ones, go do seed, have fun. I think when you get, I, I do think a lot of funds get nervous and risk averse and let, let these go when the market's not particularly attractive. But I think the really best investors, which are really the people I compete with, don't do that. And it, so I think the, the world of venture, we talked about this, uh, you know, the podcast I do with Mike, the world of venture is more stratified that tier two investors are very different than tier one. And I think yeah. this is true on the series A dimension. Uh, you don't want to pull your foot off the gas in series A if you're, if you're a really strong investor, but the natural reaction of most firms in most partnerships is to do that, which is a, generally a mistake. Um, I think in series A, if the price, if you think about the pricing, let's assume that the median valuation for a seed round is between 10 and 20 these days. And let's say a series A, it's like 30, 40, maybe 50. Sure. That's a pretty good, I agree with you that I'd rather pay 30, 40 for all the learnings versus yeah. 15 to 20 for no learnings often, but then I have to compete with more people. You know, one of the other things I've pointed out is in about 11 years doing this, I think there's 
somewhere between five or six or so term sheets I've extended where I didn't close them, like I lost to somebody. And the reality is that four of the six or two thirds of them are the same or to the same people. Um, so like, it looks like it's a very hyper competitive world, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, I'm competing with like one or two other people. Um, and so if I wait to the series A, I know that there's a decent chance that these people have taste, like my taste, and they're actually pretty good at what they do and they can close, they know how to close and they have, you know, good references to all these things. So if I go seed, most of these people do not love to do seed and I can get involved before they figure out what the hell's going on. Um, that's much better for me, even if I have to pay a slightly disproportionate skewed price, you know, to do that. Keith, you know I love you and think the world of you. You're a competitive motherfucker. Why don't you just beat them at A? Like, have you, you must reflect. Well, I tried, but like you're, even if you're great at what you do, you're going to win, call it 50, 60, 70%. You're not going to close 100. At seed, I can probably close 100% of the things I want to invest in um, if I want to. And so if I want to pay, you know, pay an appropriate price, there's no way that go head to head with the top two or three other investors at Series A, you're gonna have a 100% win rate, period. No, I agree with that. Can I ask you, you mentioned there about like the concrete uh, analogy with regards to culture and kind of processes within companies. We spoke before the show about operators becoming investors. The biggest mistake I see with operators becoming investors is they're attracted to businesses where they think they can help most and they like, like to be needed. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And my, my question to you is, how do you think about whether operators will make good investors? How you don't become a magnet for, oh, they need me and so I want to help? Well, I'm not worried about investing in companies that need me. Um, I actually don't mind that. But the art is knowing why they need me and how to be helpful in not crowd out muscle building that the company needs to do. Every great company builds its own muscle. It's its own cult. It's its own unique cult. And it needs to be great at lots of things, customer acquisition, recruiting, you know, later it may be comms, you know, et cetera, et cetera, uh, finance. All these things are really important fundamental building blocks that you do not want to crowd out. However, I think there are advantages that you can provide as someone who's built companies before and sees a breadth of companies being built and you can borrow ideas or connect ideas or remix ideas that might be insightful to a founder. And so that's what I tried to do is provide either conceptual framework. So like Max, for example, at FAIR, he never asks me what the right answer is. Like he'll pose like, here's what's top of mind. Here's the three things top of mind for me in you know, this 101. The, the question is never what's the right answer. It's, the question is always phrased in terms of, what's a, do you have a useful conceptual framework for thinking through what to do here? Because the only reason he's raising a topic is there's stark trade-offs. And then the question is, is there a unifying framework that you can apply? Another question, you know, that might help with a founder is they might say, hey, do you know anybody else who's had to deal with this very specific problem before and has successfully navigated it? And then I might know, I might even have dealt with it myself having, you know, run, run stuff for like 13 years, or I may remember having sit on, you know, having a transport board of, well, this company actually had this exact problem. And you know what we did? Didn't work at all. So definitely don't do that. But, you know, maybe if we try over here. So that kind of vantage point can be extremely valuable to top tier investors. I used to laugh, you know, I remember when I would do uh, one-on-ones with like Patrick Collison and Stripe. I'd sit down, like typically we do it over a meal, like lunch or something or dinner. And he'd have a list prepared. And by the time he got to the second question, I, I'd be like, like laughing, like cracking up. And, you know, <laughs> he probably thinks, looked at me mystified while I was laughing. I was like, because by the time I got this second question, he saved all the hardest damn questions. And because obviously all the all the easy questions, those guys are so good. They clearly already moved forward and they never even get on this list. And so it'd be like like a walking IQ test of like, here's the three or four or five or six most difficult problems. Can you be helpful on any of them? And it, you know, if I could add value on one or two of them, I was personally pretty happy <laughs> just looking at a mirror. Like, oh my God, thank God. Because like these are really rigorous. Like I tried to go to bed early the night before I'd have dinner. <laughs> with that because I knew like my brain is going to get like really challenged. Can I ask, we, we mentioned seed there being, you know, less competitive, but harder and people shying away. We mentioned A being the best risk reward. Growth is pretty dead, as I think we're both seeing. Do we think it'll stay that way? And are you excited to be more active in growth or, or not? I think that growth is pretty broken. Um, I think yeah. most growth funds were pretty bad at what they were doing and they've kind of 
died. Why were they? Why were they bad? Because they were just price insensitive. Chasing momentum, not really understanding fundamental company building, thinking spreadsheets to take results, like you know, not understanding the inputs versus the outputs. That these companies are built by people, not by math. At the end of the day, so I think most growth funds are either dead or dying. So I think there's a zone there that's pretty non-competitive. It's not what I do for a living. Um, you know, you have to figure out what your comparative advantage is in life. And I don't think growth investing is mine. I've made a few growth investments over the last three years and three or four years. Unfortunately, they've worked out. But I'm extremely careful if I'm leading a growth round that I think I have some alpha, some comparative advantage. Like, so for example, back in my KB days, one of the better investments I made was co-leading the Series C for Stripe. But, you know, I worked at PayPal Square, I understood financial services pretty well. Um, so I, there's a reason why I was dialed into um, that price, uh, being willing and comfortable investing at that price. At the time at KV, when we invested in Stripe Series C, it was an order of magnitude more expensive than the entry price for any investment in the history of KV. And back to the point, though, about the partner meetings being sometimes counterintuitive. The, one of the things that was most valuable was Samir was pushing me. He's like, you should do this. If you got, you know, and then David said to me, look, I know this is not normally my style to be like price insensitive, but you need to be able to make this call. Like you should be better situated to make this call than anybody else on the planet. Just decide, don't worry about what my, what my normal feedback is. So Samir and David being very enthusiastic that I should lean in if I wanted to, gave me more courage and more conviction because this was pretty early in my career. I was either the first or second year there. So that's why sometimes the partner meeting can be exciting and like give you more conviction and confidence. I don't know that I would have proceeded had they been more cynical actually because it was so early in my trajectory, but they were like, nope, this is where this is what we hired you to do. This is the area you should know better. Make a call. Translating this back, I don't, I rarely do growth. I let a growth in uh, Series C at FAIR but I've been in the board since the seed round. Both of the two co-founders, uh, most senior two co-founders worked for me. Um, I was like, I know this business cold. There's nobody in the world who's going to understand this business and the founders better than me. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and you know, so like, it's rare. I led a, sheer, a very unusual growth round at Founders Fund at Ultima, which is a bio kind of uh, genetic sequencing company. The only reason I did that was I watched the company grow up at, while I was at KV, I had known the founder through my experience at KV probably back to like 2010. And I understood the fundamental science, just having walked through all these partner meetings with Samir and the founder. So when it came to the growth round, I didn't have any concerns at all on the science or the innovation or the technology. It was all go-to-market stuff. And that's that was easy for me to bet, to do reference calls to customers. That's like down the middle for any VC. Um, otherwise, I never would have led that growth round. It would have been like terrifying to me. So once in a while, but uh, I think for other people, like for example, a founders fund could be very successful in growth because I think most other growth funds are basically not able to compete and founders fund has great talent in the growth side. When I put on Twitter that we were doing this show, I got a load of DMs and they were saying, $3 billion in KV fund. Seriously, like how can you make money on a fund that size? Uh, so I'd love to put that to you so you can kind of break that down and debunk that. Sure. How do you respond to that? I, I, so properly sizing uh, a venture fund is one of these other complicated arts in the industry. I think the key is there's a couple of inputs. One is what stage are you investing in? How many opportunities are there likely to be? In, and then C, what's the team composition? Uh, the team, your internal team. Um, so let's walk through this. So KV, although that sounds like a big number, 415 million of that is for seed investing, 1.5 billion or so is for venture, and only about eight or 900 million is for growth. So as a firm and a you know, set of partners that really enjoy seed investing, that's the node right down the middle, Samir right down the middle of what he likes to do, is probably my comparative advantage in life. You have three to five partners that all really strongly like to lead seed rounds. So $400 million isn't unreasonable at all for a seed fund, a high conviction, high ownership seed fund. Then you look at the venture side. Okay, you have 1.5 billion. If you're really doubling down pro and reinvesting or leading A's in the portfolio of seed, 
You can consume a decent amount of that. And let's say you compete in the external world for another half of it. It's not that far off the sizing when you have five MDs plus a team of partners like Nikita and Alex Morgan who are really good at what they do. Um, so you can, you can see with like seven, eight kind of lead investors, a $1.5 billion venture fund being moderately appropriately sized actually. So you have, to combine, you have to combine all of these and triangulate a bit. So I totally get you and agree with you. And this is why I hate bluntly a lot of media and journalism where they just conflate shit and it's wrong. When you look at 400 though, Keith, take out fees, we're at 320 investable, okay? Take, so we can do 100, say, checks uh, and, you know, they're, what are they, 3.2? You want to be a little little less than 100. 100 might be a little bit much to make a little bit more dollars per, but fundamentally. But if we we were doing reserves to initial, you could do 50 and still have a one-to-one. 50 is a pretty diverse portfolio. That's what you want. I mean, I think the the guidance I learned, and I don't know this is as rigorous as many things, but is roughly a good portfolio for a fund. Should be about 50 like that. So 50 is the right, 30 to 50. Uh, so you're in the zone of like what most people would advise. You're certainly not outside of it, but it does come down to how many barrels you're shooting through. Like I have this metaphor I use in company building about barrels and ammunition. Make sure it works that way too. How many people are going to be high quality investors do you have at any given time in a fund? It's usually a smaller number than you think. There's kind of almost like a micro power law within a power law. And so if you have two, three, four, five, six quality investors, you can, you can size the fund you know, significantly greater than if you have two or three. I totally get you there. If you think about it, four or five, you've got 12 each, and that's not a huge amount across a three-year fund deployment period. It's not, and it, you know, it depends how you define what the breakpoints are between these various funds. Like what's the criteria for seed? What's the criteria for venture? Where's the line for growth? As you move those numbers around, you can also see whether the size makes sense. So if you look at it, like ultimately your fund size does affect your strategy or should, it has to be a recursive dialogue. So founders fund, which has more total assets under management, let's say, or more the current fund, current funds are probably closer to four bill um, than three. The allocation is very different though. It's 900 million or so in FF8 and about 3.2 billion, I think in the growth fund, growth two. So it's, it's a different weighting and you can, you see it, and then so you need to have a strategy that's coherent around the people, the team, and the weighting of your fund sizes. Can I ask you when we spoke last time, and I said, "What would you change about Founders Fund?" You said we could be younger. Could Coastler be younger? Would the same apply here? You know, good question. I don't know yet. I mean, there's the five senior people, the, the four people that are most senior at or MDs, you know, the official MDs at KVO, the same people I worked with um, when I was there. I haven't worked with most of the people that are not at the partner level at KV. I have worked with Nikita before. I mean, that's one of the reasons I recruited him. Um, I've worked closely with Alex Morgan, lots lots of uh, interesting dialogues and debates. So I know those two pretty well. The rest of the team, I don't know very well, so I, I shouldn't really opine yet. What do you think KV can learn from Founders Fund? I think the rigor around growth investing, I actually, I've learned this personally. Um, I think FF is very strong at figuring out how to value a growth stage opportunity. And that translates the reason why I care more than what, you might- what, what, what makes them good at it where the growth investors we mentioned before sucked? That's a great question, actually. Um, and I'm not sure I know the answer other than just watching who produces successful investments or not. But the, the one thing that was most relevant to me to learn is you have to make all these pro rata decisions in your best companies. So, you know, I say I lead a seed for DoorDash and the series A, pro rata, that's easy, not, not difficult. But then C, D, E, you know, at different prices or open door, 400 million, 500 million, 600 million, do, do you do these rounds? How do you think about them? And I don't think back in my day at KB that we had a lot of analytical rigor to those late stage piranha decisions. Uh, whereas at Founders Fund, the growth team is very dialed in to evaluating those opportunities. And so I felt like I learned a lot about how they do their work that would make me sharper about my own piranha decisions on the companies I'm most involved with. Yeah, I, I totally get you. I mean, Peter Thiel often says about the decision not to do, I think the B of Facebook 
Well, the AFS, but being his well, most costly. Mistake. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to make a mistake. <laughs> uh, I actually think that, I, you know, I have my own coherent version of this. I actually, you know, have my own set of views about when and when not to do Piranha as applied to the companies I'm involved in. But I, I learned a lot from like working with Napoleon and his team at Founderson. I spoke to Mike, but you're like, how the fuck did you speak to so many people before this show, Harry? We agreed it last night. But I also spoke to Mike at um, Traba, <laughs> and he asked the question, why would founders prefer working with one firm versus another? And I never wanted this to be like a trash talking. It's not at all. It's just different styles. It's a matchmaking exercise at the end of the day. The right founder paired with the right investor increases the probabilities of success for the company, in my view. And so every founder who's successful, every founder who has a shot of being really successful is different. Like Mike is definitely different than other founders. Mike and Jack Dorsey, for example, very, very different. Both extreme, going to be extremely successful. The, the correct pairing for different founders is who's complementary to you, who, who can you work with and add value but be on the same page with. And I think like, so for example, Mike has very strong views on culture, how to run a company, how to build a company. Being in line with his views allows me to be more effective because when I'm channeling feedback, we're not debating first principles ever. But once in a while, I may see something or, you know, in this cartoonish mirror, I, like, I can play back to him his decisions or what I see and say, hey, just applying your own principles, your own philosophy, does this make sense? versus debating whether his philosophy is correct, he would he would be a horrible pairing with someone who doesn't agree with his philosophy. They would just have like a constant thrash, it would be useless. Or so let's take another example, Jack. Jack is very design driven and he wanted to build Square in a design driven culture, which is, you know, let's say jargonistically like Apple-esque, most people don't know what that really means, but like fundamentally a design driven culture. Pairing Jack with someone who doesn't appreciate design would be an unmitigated disaster. Like the investment in the design, the quality of design, the thoughtfulness, the crafting, the perfectionism across so many different dimensions would just be in, almost unfathomable to someone who grew up in a bottom-up empirical, you know, everything's not quantifying, A-B testing. So you have to be careful. Uh, and that's why I think, you know, speed dating during COVID was a disaster for everybody. It wasn't good for founders to do Zoom-based investing. It wasn't good for investors. And so I think it's healthier to take your time as a founder and find someone who can be insightful, but is directionally aligned with your ambition, with your prioritization. And that that's when you get a match that really works for like a decade. Do you think FF and KV have the same type of founder? When I look at like Mike, he fits the founder mold for what I think a founder's fund founder would be. Run through walls, very opinionated, very kind of hard and shares a lot of traits with I think a lot of other FF founders I know. Do you think KV has an archetype like that? Yeah, I actually do. I mean, I think one of the reasons why you see such a high portfolio overlap is like the proof side of the pudding. Um, so, you know, obviously KV and FF have almost exactly the same ownership in Traba. Um, I believe in open store, we have the same preferred ownership, KV and FF. I think in um, Avon, um, FF, FF and KV have very similar ownerships. So we all, and, well, and a lot of people at KV are founder driven. I wouldn't say that's the only criteria at KV. Sometimes KV can be technology driven, innovation driven, whereas FF is mostly founder driven. But the Venn diagram overlap of a successful founder is pretty high, which is why the portfolio overlap, H Sleep, you know, more portfolio overlap, Varda, more portfolio overlap, Ultima Bio, as we talked about, more fair, high portfolio overlap. So the, obviously the criteria, you know, is clearly similar because you're seeing the manifestation of that in the portfolios. Can I ask you another one, which is like when you were thinking about just this option, always other options come to mind. Did you consider other options? Not with a pre-existing fund. I, I felt that at KV, I you know, knew why we were successful. We were successful. I knew why, or at least I think I know why. And I thought that that would be helpful. I think every other fund, the grass may be a little bit greener kind of problem of like, they have their own bodies. You know, there's, there's more mess, you know, somewhere else don't want to fix other people's messes kind of like lesson. Um, you know, over the years, and I'd say over the 15 year time horizon, last 15 years of my life, I have occasionally thought about, should I start a fund? 
Um, there's definitely a lot of drag coefficient associated with that that I was not particularly excited with, which is why sort of my definition, I have a start of the fund. Um, I did look at it very seriously in 2010 or so and 2013 before joining KV. I had a pretty specific idea about a fund, but for lots of reasons, what I like to do is most importantly, find undiscovered founders, give them the opportunity to be successful with advice, counsel, and capital, and then work with those founders and help them shift the probabilities of success so that they can achieve the ambitions for their company. That's what I want to do. Everything else is a drag coefficient to me. Why did you not think you could get rid of the drag coefficient? I was the same, but then I'm like, I just hired the FOs. I don't think you can get rid of the drag coefficient, certainly from scratch. I mean, they say the first six months, let's say, heavy drag coefficient. Can you later reduce? It's like a high fixed cost, the way one very successful founder uh, described it to me as I was asking for a little bit of advice. The fixed cost is very high. And once you get over the fixed cost, maybe the marginal cost is, is, is more tolerable. But that first fixed cost is really painful. And I like what I do. I and mean, the reason why I work is I really enjoy meeting these founders discovering these people and saying, yeah, this person's got a shot and then working with them and helping, you know, unlock their brain once in a while um, and helping and, and watching their eyes light up. And, you know, that that's what motivates me to eat every day. Do you ever think about money? Uh, no, not really, honestly. Yeah, because this was another question that I had, which is I had in my notes, uh, you know, you have more cash than Rockefeller. So like, what's what motivates you today? Um, so I, I have a pretty pithy answer now. So I was at one of my good friends uh, who I work with it had his 30th birthday recently. And, you know, at the dinner for his 30th birthday, the question the question at the table is, what do you want people to kind of say in your eulogy, you know, eulogy somewhat morbid, but whatever. Um, and I thought about it and it occurred to me what I want to say, what I want people to say is, I can't imagine my life without Keith in it. I, I, you know, like that had that much impact in some ways and there's different ways you can have impact, obviously. But I was like, fundamentally, I really want to have impact in people's lives and that they really think about it, that it was that impactful, that their life would have been completely different. And so this is a business version of that, you know, the entrepreneur's version of that. Can I ask, I spoke to Samir uh, before and he said, what does it take for an investor and a firm to win today after 10 years of bull run? So I think the most important thing is, first of all, and I said this several years ago on your 20 minute BC, you have to have a comparative advantage, period. And you need to isolate it for you and your fund. Like why me and why us? So for example, like our mutual friend, Mike, when he meets a new investor, he always asks them this question. He loves doing this. It's, he's great at it. He always says to them, point blank, why should a top tier founder like me take your money? And you need to have a sharp, differentiated answer to be successful. And the more differentiated, the more true that is, the better. And I think most investors either don't have that answer or forget. And so you don't want to be a commodity. You need to be special and you need to be treated special. You need, you need to have you know, either difference, like compared to them somewhere. I remember I posted publicly my investment criteria, uh, probably 2017, and you know on Twitter. And it was like, you know, kind of a note that I pub published. And the last one that confused a lot of people was the last question was, do I have a comparative advantage? And I take that pretty damn seriously. Like, why me? Why am I investing in this company? Because the general returns in venture are not strong at all. The general returns in 75, 80, and if you normalize against like the two hot periods of the last 50 years, like 1996 to 99, and take out like uh, 2019 and 21, the returns are horrific, except in maybe the top two to five, maybe 10% of venture. So if you don't have a strong answer to why you have a comparative advantage, you're going to regress to the middle of the bell curve. And the middle of the bell curve returns are just not acceptable, period. And so I always take that very, very, very seriously. And will often pass if I can't look in the mirror and say, this is why I have a comparative advantage. So like we talked about a couple of companies, fair. Both the two, the CEO and COO worked for me. I should be able to assess their abilities better than anybody else on the planet, period. And if I can't do that, I don't know why I'd be a VC. A Stripe, we talked about, you know, I helped build PayPal. I ran a large fraction of Square. I need to be able to understand Stripe pretty much pretty damn well, or I shouldn't be a VC. You know, Mike was my best friend, like is and was my best friend before he started the company. 
I definitely knew the traits that would be to, you know, the way he runs his company, the intentional culture, the tenacity, the, re the resourcefulness. That was all there from like maybe the first day I met him. What, what if you're not the best for it, but you know it is incredible? Like, are you not going to do that deal? Great question. I think at a fund, the first instinct is, do I have a partner who would be a really good pairing? And at KV, we did do this. Um, I would consciously think like, oh, David Wyden may be a really good partner for this specific, uh, you know, both market and founder, or Samir might be. There are times when Samir would be a much better partner, for example, than I would be to the, to a specific founder. It depends again, or Vinod, Vinod can be, or Sven. It really depends what the company's doing and the founder's skill set. So the first instinct would be, okay, I don't really feel I have a comparative advantage, but our fund may, or someone else at the fund may be, let's introduce them and see if that you know, kind of partnership can work really well. Um, so this does work. Now, the answer may be within our fund, whether it's Founders Fund. Do you, do you think funds actually do that? Though? I mean, dude, we know we know Midas lists are formed by no, the- We definitely, uh, KV, we absolutely do that all the time. Like like every week, like really, like like instantly. At Founders Fund, we, do, we did it too, but more on an ad hoc basis, not systematic. But at, at KV, it was very systematic. Like top down, even Vinod sometimes would say, let's say something came in, to me, he might say, hey, don't you think like Sven or Samir or David would be a better partner? The way we usually resolve it, if like, for example, it wasn't clear, sometimes we'd actually tell the founder, hey, you get a choice. Like in a founder's fund, like we might say, hey, you get a choice. Why don't you meet with three or four people and see who you think would be most useful and who's the right pairing? So that's my normal default is, if not me, is there somebody else I have conviction about? And then... If not our fund, then it's a much more complicated decision of what to do. Do you worry about the weight of your words? You look at, and I love Mike and I think he's great, but like you look at someone like Mike, he's younger than you. He's a lot less experienced than you. When you say, no, we've, this is what I think. Do you worry that you have too much impact at points? You have to be, well, I'll say globally, a VC and a board member absolutely needs to worry about this all the time. Um, so as I've learned from some of the best, the node, uh, Roloff um, taught me some lessons. I'll, uh, I'll articulate a few. Pierre Lebon taught me early in my career like how to do some of these things. So I think Roloff taught me as a board member, one of the best ways is to ask things in terms of questions, not in terms of answers. So you probe by questions because then you're never leading. Um, you may be leading a little bit, but you're never prescribing. And it's a very big difference. So you try to do that. The second thing I've learned is to describe intentionally, carefully, and calibrated your level of conviction. So I will sometimes say to something like, Mike, like I'm, my instinct is to do X, but actually I'm not that, I don't have that much confidence that I'm right. Like if you forced me to make a decision, this is how I would make the decision here is why, but it's a close call in my mind, I'm not sure. Or there's sometimes when I might say to somebody, whether Mike or someone else, I have about 80% confidence, I, I know I know the right answer here. So, the, you know, being able to communicate the level of conviction um, can help them just challenge or, or, you know, solve it. Some founders also, the other thing I, I do pretty well is reverse engineering the logic. Not always, but because sometimes it's actually hard to, to understand how you got to a conclusion. Sometimes you have this intuitive reaction and then try to decompose, okay, what's the logic behind that decision? And then, so then the founder can, like, for example, I work with Saudi at Avon. It's a really great company. He's a phenomenal founder. He always wants to know the why. It's always why, 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 why. And he does that internally. He does that with me. It's great. So I can walk through the logic underneath it. And then he can say, oh, that I buy that logic or I don't buy that logic. And so that's another, you know, sort of instantiation of it. And then the final point is, and I'll give you a, a kind of an amusing anecdote about this. I almost never, ever tell a founder what they really should do. Like, I almost never say, you must do this. Now, the, the one example that always occurs to me is there was a time when Mike was building his company uh, in Miami that he's incredibly frugal. The company's incredibly financially disciplined. And in Miami, the buildings charge a surcharge for running air conditioning uh, past certain hours. And he was hesitant to pay the air conditioning. 
um, even though they're working by night, like nine nine plus. And there was one point in time when I said to him, like, well, how much is the incremental air conditioning? It was like $6,000 or something. And I was like, Mike, you should pay for the air conditioning. That's about the most direct I've ever been with a founder. I, I love that. That's uh, that's such a Mike thing to do. It's like, yeah, yeah that's, that's just hot. They're like, like everyone will definitely should pay for the air conditioning. Yeah, we should, you know what I can say? We should charge them for saunas. <laughs> can I ask you, you mentioned there about venture not being like necessarily a great asset class in terms of returns. I totally agree with you. Actually, when you look at the historical data on distributions, there's very small windows where liquidity is apparent and strong. And if you don't take advantage of them, it's quite crap, even for the best, actually. How do you think about when to sell. My biggest mistake, I didn't sell shit in the last era. I'm not sure I have a great answer to this, by the way. And one of the benefits of being a super early stage investor is you don't have to be perfect. I've watched other people make these decisions and I've seen brilliance sometimes. So for example, uh, KB before my days uh, invested $10 million or roughly $10 million in the seed rounds for Square. After I joined KB, there was always a question after, you know, obviously Square went public, when sell, the market didn't really appreciate Square fairly for a long time. So there's lots of debate internally. And Vinod had a very strong perspective that proved out to be incredibly valuable, incredibly prescient, predicated on a couple of key dimensions. And I won't, I won't show the exact logic, but fundamentally, he had a very strong view that KV should absolutely not sell, period. And it turned out to produce meaningfully different results based upon his insight. And I remember listening to those debates, I wasn't able to participate because I had my own shares, you know, as an executive. So I was completely recused from deciding what to sell. But the logic and his insight was incredibly penetrating and it led to significantly better returns for KB3. Understanding how to think about that um, is a real superpower, but I think it's very rare and I, I certainly haven't mastered it. Can I ask what makes Vinod so special? Because Vin Vinod, sorry, I'm just being I'm super honest. He's a, he's weird in the way that, like him and his brand are like on the ascent again, and it's respectfully so, I mean, it's like there, wow. There's a couple there's a couple of ingredients. Um, first, he is a technologist at heart. He really does see the implications of a new technology way before other people do, and can see the implications of society, the implications of business, the disruptive elements. A decade often before the people he was on the you know the ai crusade before i even joined kv in 2013. he published papers about you know how ai was going to replace doctors and medicine and this is like before i joined kv so way ahead of the curve really understand understood the implications potential of ai and really masters like how the dots connect and spends lots of time with all the leading practitioners both in acad academic academia and on the ground you know in companies so that's one. Second thing is just pure input. He still works hard. He loves his craft. He loves working with founders. I've seen him work 8 a.m. to midnight on Sundays sometimes, like taking meetings. This is a Mike Shabbat thing too, you know, like him and Vinod. Like Vinod still takes meetings, still outworks most people over less than half his age. What do you think drives Vinod? He, well, he, he really does love changing the world through technology. It really motivates him. If he could, you know, the only thing that actually... Sometimes he's so good at seeing the implications that you have to find the founder who can actually take advantage of the insight, which is I mean, there's only so many founders who are amazing. And like some, you, sometimes you can't take all your ideas to get them in the hands of world-class founders. That's probably the only thing that frustrates. When you think about kind of reflecting on your time with Founders Fund, what's been your, if we, before we do a quick fire, what's your biggest takeaway from that time and how it impacted your investing style? I think you learned, well, I mean, I've had the advantage of, being a senior person at two different funds. And I think what you learn from that experience is what's endemic to venture. There are fundamentals about our business that are basically baked into the business. And then what are, what are optional decisions around culture, decision-making, hiring? And then how can you tease those out to be more successful? So I think having two different vantage points, I hopefully will lock in my brain and allow me to manipulate you know, those decisions to be ideal, you know, ideal to produce the best possible outcome and produce the best possible happiness for me. Um, but it's very rare to have like those kind of unique vantage points. So that's my 
takeaways. I, I mentioned, like, for example, I learned significantly more about growth investing and how to be disciplined about figuring out the valuation for a high potential company, et cetera. That I'll take with me. But just how do you make decisions? What's the best way to make decisions? How much time should you spend in a partner meeting versus not? What are the benefits of spending eight hours a week in a partner meeting versus spending 30 minutes a week? Where's that fine line? You know, where's the diminishing marginal returns, et cetera? Did kids change your mindset, Keith? becoming a father? I think <laughs> there's a couple of epiphanies you have at a minimum. I strongly believe, but have watched it already. My kids are two and a half years old, that people are much more baked and impressionable at earlier ages that dictate how they are when they grow up at much earlier ages than people realize. They absorb so much. And even if they can't communicate back to you what they're absorbing, they are absolutely absorbing their brain. It's like, you know, in the kind of AI world, their, their inputs are kind of like training their brain in a kind of machine learning sense. And so you want to be very careful and very thoughtful about what those inputs are, even though you, most parents are not. So I, I think incredibly conscious about that and just watching what they've already been able to learn, absorb, that started almost like from day one. Do you feel the weight of that responsibility? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, like for example, the the downside of having access to resources, like you know, money, et cetera, is I feel the weight of anti entitlement. Like I, I think about this every day of how do we have kids that are not entitled? Because it's natural, like they have a lot of benefits. And I, I want them to I want them to have the work ethic of someone who has nothing. How do you think about doing that? I chatted to David at Newbank and he was like, it's the hardest thing I think I have to do. I've, I've, I've actually discussed this with a lot of people who've seen, you know, people that have watched raise kids that I think are really, you know, successful and inspiring and ask them very specifically, what'd you do, what'd you not do, what'd you think about, what'd you not, and try to borrow some ideas. But it's a complicated topic, um, but I, I'm stressed out about it, but basically every day. Can I be honest? I worry with kids that I will not be present. Like if I want to do what I do to the best and I want to win, just like you, you have to fucking give it everything and you have to be an absolute monster, uh, I think, personally. Well, I think there's definitely important ingredients to success. And you need to be thoughtful about what's most important to you in achieving success. But people have irrational success, top 10 basis points, one basis point in any field are absolutely making trade-off decisions, hopefully intentionally. A hundred percent. You can be like eight out of 10 good and be there for dinner, I think. But if you want to be like 9.9 .9 out of 10, which you have to be in venture, I don't think you can be home for dinner every night. Yeah. I mean, I think there are some VCs who might have been able to somehow do that, but I think they offset it at other times in other ways. And there, there is no short. I don't believe there's shortcuts to success. Like as I mentioned on one of your, uh, one of your recording podcasts before, one of the benefits of just you know people knowing me in other fields is I get to watch really successful people in music, politics, and sports. And I was in law, and the common traits that lead to success are, or the traits that lead to success are shockingly common, and a lot of it is just pure input. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Right, are you ready for a quick fire, my friend? Let's go. Okay, so one from Sam here. What do you think about Bitcoin going forward? <sighs> Major question. Um, honestly, I don't know. I've, I've been a multiple kind of minds on this. I think I've had a unifying theme, and then I guess you can apply this uh, theory and then make a projection for yourself. So my theory was always from 2013 or 14 that the adoption of Bitcoin would globally be inversely correlated to the rule of law in a specific market or specific country. And I think that's proven to be true. And in fact, I think even in the United States, Bitcoin really took off in terms of valuation, uh, market cap, et cetera, after the election of Trump. And that was perceived by the market as instability or less rule of law. You debate whether that's true or false, but there was a perception. And so I think what happens is in 2024 is somewhat dictates the answer. If people believe the world is more stable, the role of law is likely to be more robust, Bitcoin doesn't appreciate. 
But if the world is more tumultuous, the rule of law takes steps back in major markets, then I think Bitcoin appreciates. Keith, which way do you think the world's going to go? I know I have some. Well, I think 2024 is going to be pretty tumultuous. Yeah, I was about to say. It's, so off to a pretty, it's, off, it's certainly off to that start. Is Trump going to win? No. You know, as you probably see on Twitter, I don't even believe he's going to be the Republican nominee for president. Okay. Do you think he'll go to prison? I don't know. You know, one of the things you learn to do when you focus your time, and I focus my time on investing and working with founders and berries, I've had to subtract out of my brain a lot of legal interests. Like I used to be a pretty damn good lawyer or litigator, and I used to have intellectual curiosity about a lot of topics in law. I just, I haven't read all the complaints. I haven't focused on them. I know they exist, et cetera. I know the general arc of them. But I don't have a strong opinion about the quality of the cases and the likely outcome. Did Figma kill M&A in 2024? Well, I don't think it's Figma qua Figma. I think Figma in some ways was an easier case for the government in the FTC, which has been very aggressive than many other cases. You know, Figma is competitive with Adobe's products. Like at the end of the day, that's not like a stretch where the FTC has been taking some crazy positions based upon, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years of American jurisprudence. They've been really confronting um, some acquisitions that really don't have market overlap. This one seems down the, much more down the middle. As did Plaid and Visa, um, I think that one, a normal conservative antitrust lawyer like me, like I grew up as an antitrust lawyer, I could see bringing that case. I can also see bringing the Adobe Figma case. Most of the other stuff the FTC does seems like ridiculous. Will IPO windows open again in 2024? Oh, absolutely. So I don't believe that IPO windows really close or open. I think just the criteria for success is different in that, you know, what the bar is on, let's say, revenue or what the bar is on your unit economics. But as a founder, for, do you think you'd want to go out? You mentioned, John, like, as a strike, why would I go out in 24? I'm going to get... I, I believe that most companies, you know, and I have a chapter in Eli Gill's High Growth Handbook on the topic in a, uh, in a fairly lengthy core answer as well. On, I believe most companies are better off going public early, period. And so I still prescribe that. I still advise that. I hope, you know, a lot of the companies I work with will take advantage of that advice. Where would you, could you get better as an investor, Keith? Oh, so my biggest flaw, and you know, if you have any solutions, I'm all ears because it's still, it's very persistent, is the hardest part for me is deciding which first meetings to take. And you know, you get a large amount of inbound interest, introductions, et cetera. And deciding of that pool, you can't take them all. It's like not possible in, in like C to literally meet every company. Whereas the growth people can meet every company that's ready for a growth round. Yep. You have to decide. And I have made several bad mistakes historically as an angel investor, as a professional at BC and declining some meetings. Once you get me in the room with founders, I've made those calls really, really well. Like I was mentioning the other day that I'm not sure I've ever passed on somebody that's turned out to be building a multi-billion dollar company, but I have definitely declined meetings for companies that turned out to be good. You can try like take more meetings, but then is your brain really sharp? You can try to delegate it, but if your founder taste is off, like the person you delegate to isn't really helping. I would say yes for two things. One, like, I mean this in the nicest way. If someone I hugely respect or like sends me something, I'll jump on it that day and do it myself. Or if it's something where I love it, where like you may do with you know, fintech or payments or whatever that may be specifically related to your experience, I'll jump on it and kind of everything else. I just have, this sounds awful, but like a person in the team who just meets everything else. And that way I feel no guilt on like, will we miss it? Because if it's yeah. great, they'll send it back to but, me. But I, I have guilt. I definitely try to find, I'm trying to find like a better way to do it. But it, and you know, and Roloff mentioned this to me. I remember talking to him a year after he joined Sequoia, it's probably like 2004. And we had coffee and I said, what's the hardest part of the job? And he said, deciding which first meetings to take. Did he give you an answer? He probably did, but it hasn't, obviously it hasn't worked for me. Uh, where would you send your kids to college, Samir, again? Uh, Teal Fellowship. <laughs> okay. We're definitely on the Teal Fellowship crusade. Uh, you know, I've been tweeting about it. I mentioned to Peter recently that I think that was probably the most important thing he's done. Um, you know, I think... Hopefully they want to, they want to achieve 
in their own way. And I think tail fellowship is a great way, you know, to cultivate those values. Do you think Europe is descending into a retirement home? You know, Larry Summers' quote is still pretty good that Europe's a museum. I think that's probably pretty apt. Is there anything I could do better, Keith? You've known me for a few years. Oh, wow. I mean, it seems like the combination of, uh, you know, content plus investing is working really well. It is differentiated, as we talked about. There's not that many people who do it, period. And so I think it's a cohesive, coherent, unique strategy, which is, I think, how you get alpha in venture. So that's great. Um, I think the guest quality is obviously awesome. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, no, I would keep going. Like, if you have a strategy, keep doing, you know, keep, keep, keep chasing it. Uh, eventually, all strategies and venture, people learn that they're effective and can reverse engineer them. But you may have a five or 10 year window before that's the case. Final one for you, my friend. If we think about Keith 10 years I out, is Keith at KV then? Is Keith doing his own fun then? Is Keith chilling? What? Well, I think the two most obvious components to answer are, I would definitely not be chilling and I will not do my own fund. Will I do something outside technology? That's a, you know, open question. Should I, when I, will I, when I one day do something that's very different um, at some point in my life? Maybe. Did the KAVLPs know that you were joining when they invested? Oh, definitely not. The funds were all closed. Oh, they must be happy then. <laughs> Hopefully, I, I know. So I don't know them all, but it, you know, obviously, there's a, a good group from six years ago. There's a good overlap, actually, with FFLPs that I know pretty well too. So hopefully, hopefully they're happy. Um, I actually enjoy meeting with LPs and brainstorming with them. Keith, I so enjoyed this. Thank you so much for doing it, and I always love our chats. Pleasure to be back.